This is a video that is a quick introduction to what a homeomorphism is in topology. And then we'll run through an example about some, how do you show um, that you've got a homeomorphism on your hands? So let's start off with the definition of what this is. So let's say you've got two topological spaces. I've got two sets X and Y, and they each have their own topology T and T prime. And let's say I've got a function that goes from X to Y. We're going to say F is a homeomorphism. And we would also say that in this case, X and Y are homeomorphic or some older terminology would be that they're topologically equivalent. Uh, what this means for F to be a homeomorphism though is the following three things. The first thing is that F is a bijection, so one-to-one -one and onto. The second thing is that F is continuous. And the third thing is that F inverse is also continuous. And now before we get into an example to try to illustrate this definition, let's just talk for a brief minute and zoom out. Why are these important or of interest to mathematicians? And the relation X is homeomorphic to Y, that's an equivalence relation on the collection of all topological spaces. So this satisfies you know, the reflexive, symmetric, and transitive properties of an equivalence relation. And so what that allows us to do then, it is allows us to say, if X has some important property, such as say being Hausdorff or connected or some other topological property that I might care about. If X has that property, then any space homeomorphic to X is gonna have that property too. And so it allows us to classify big groups of sets and try to distinguish them and their interesting properties. Rather than one by one, we can kind of bunch them together, sort of like biologists do, like putting animals into different phylums and things. All right, so let's look at an example to try to demonstrate this concept of a homeomorphism. So I'm gonna let my first topological space be the plane. So the first metric on R2 I'm gonna consider is D, and the definition of D is gonna be the maximum of the difference between the two components in absolute value. In other words, how far apart X1 and X2 are, and then how far apart Y1 and Y2 are, I'm just gonna take the maximum of those two differences. I've drawn you a little picture down here of what the unit ball would look like if this is how you're measuring distances in the plane. And uh, the unit ball in this case is a square. And so the definition of that ball would be all x, y in the plane whose distance from the origin is less than one. And of course you get that square there. So this is what we call the, op the unit open disk with respect to D. And of course that's the same thing as the Cartesian product of the open interval minus one to one, those are your x values, with the open interval minus one to one, those are your y values. Now our second topological space Y is also gonna be a copy of the plane, but it's gonna have a different metric on it and therefore theoretically a different topology. And let's let D prime be the kind of typical distance function that you teach your students about maybe in, in college algebra, or if you are a student that you encountered in college algebra. So just the difference in the X coordinate squared plus the difference in the Y coordinate squared. And uh, if I drew you a picture of what like the unit circle or unit ball looks like in that, uh, in that case, it's just my familiar circle that is uh, x squared plus y squared, and I want all the points inside of it, say, so less than one. So that'll be the unit open disk with respect to d prime. So d is the sort of maximum of the distance between the components of the two points, and d prime is my good old Euclidean distance. And what I'm gonna show is that the function f from x to y defined by f takes an ordered pair x, y to the same ordered pair x, y, in other words, the identity map, I'm going to show you that this is a homeomorphism. So in other words, kind of the big picture here, what I'm going to try to show you is that the plane equipped with either one of these metrics um, are going to be two spaces that are homeomorphic to each other. And so the properties of the topology, uh, the properties that the topology that D determines, they're going to give me the same properties that the topology uh, uh, determined by D prime uh, properties that that has. All right, so here's our proof. And remember, to show that something's a homeomorphism, if I'm gonna do this from the definition and not using some other characterization of a homeomorphism, remember there's three things that I need to show. First thing I need to show is that F is a bijection. And of course, being a bijective, you'd start maybe with showing it's injective, at least that's just what I do. Injective means once to one. So if F of AB is the same thing as F of CD, well then what does F do? F just gives you back AB and CD. So that tells you AB equals CD. And so that shows that uh, this function F is injective. And then now uh, the other thing for bijective would be to show that it's surjective or onto. And how does that go? Well, we're gonna take any point in the codomain, uh, which is Y, so any point X, Y that's in Y, then we would just consider that exact same point, but living in the domain, because what do I know my function does? F is gonna send that blue point to the green point. And so that shows me that every point in the codomain is actually in the range. In other words, the range is equal to the codomain, and that's surjective or onto. 
So that wasn't so bad. The harder thing to show for us, perhaps, is that, let's say f is continuous. How are we gonna show f is continuous? And the way I'm gonna do that is the following. Let's take a point, x, y, uh, that's in the codomain y here. And typically you need to show like the pre-image of an open set is open. And I'm really gonna leverage the fact here that I've got a metric space. And so like my open sets are all unions and intersections of these nice little open balls that the metric determines. So I'm really using the fact that those are a basis for the topology. So let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. And so what it suffices to do, when I look at the pre-image or inverse image of an open ball determined by d prime of radius epsilon, I'm using a semicolon, this notation for an open ball is uh, using a semicolon between the point x, y and the radius epsilon. I don't want you to think that's a j or something. So the pre-image of this open ball, I need to, well, in this case, that's just going to be the, the same open ball because f is just the identity map. It doesn't give you anything new. What I need to do is I need to show you, though, that this is open with respect to d. So I need to show you that if I've got this epsilon ball that looks like this, that's determined by d prime or that's measured using d prime, I need to show you that that's also open if I measured things using d. And so the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to show you that uh, this picture of this d prime ball on the left that it actually contains a D ball centered at X, Y of some radius delta. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna choose delta to be epsilon divided by the square root of two. And this is kind of the typical, I got that number by working backwards. And you're gonna see my thought process for how I get epsilon over root two, because you'll see that things work out pretty at the end and we'll get uh, less than epsilon, like in real analysis. So what does that look like though? I'm gonna try to justify to you my picture here that that square who's, you know, um, halfway across is epsilon over square root of two, that that square should fit inside of this yellow uh, circle. And so, well, how am I gonna do that? Let's let A, B be any point that's inside the blue square of that particular radius, epsilon over the square root of two. Now, what it means for A, B to be in that, um, to be in that ball is that the distance from AB to XY is less than epsilon over the square root of two. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna impact that. We're gonna say that in lots of different ways. So the first way we're gonna say that is, that says that the maximum of the distance between X and A, so like the distance on the real line between those real numbers, and the distance from Y to B, that the maximum of that is less than epsilon over two. Right? That's the definition of D. But if you think about it, if the maximum of those two things are less than epsilon over root two, then that says each individual one should be less than epsilon over root two. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna square both sides. So that says that both the square of x minus a and epsilon over root two quantity squared, and the same thing for y and b, that both of those should be uh, less than epsilon over root two quantity squared. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add these things together. So if I add the two things on the left, x minus a squared plus y minus b squared, that'll definitely be less than if I added epsilon over root two squared to itself. So in other words, two epsilon over root two squared. And then now the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna notice some algebra here. If I square the right side, epsilon over root two, the twos will cancel. So really on the right side, you just got epsilon squared. Finally, let's take the square root of both sides. And I recover that c on the left side is kind of my distance function from college algebra. And that's exactly what, uh, what we're gonna write down here. That says that the d prime distance from x, y to a, b is less than epsilon. In other words, a, b is in the d prime ball uh, that we wanted here. So we just show that if I start off with any point in the blue square, then yes, it's inside the yellow circle as well. So that is the argument for how you'd show that. So thus, the d ball of radius epsilon over root two is contained in the d prime ball of radius epsilon. So we've shown that the d prime ball is open with respect to d. And so that means that f is continuous. Now the last thing we've got to do, step three, we've got to do a similar thing to try to argue that f inverse is continuous. Now f inverse is also just the identity map, sends x, y to the point x, y still. And so the way we got to do that though, is if I take a point x, y in, the, in x, and I take an epsilon bigger than zero, again, it suffices to show that in this case, you know, the pre-image of f inverse, that's just gonna be f, right? So, so that f of a d ball centered at x, y of radius epsilon, well, that's the same thing as just the d ball centered at x, y of radius epsilon, because like I said, all f does is it just spits out the same points that you started with, so it doesn't change anything there. I need to show you that this is open with respect to d prime now. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna show that this d ball contains a d prime ball 
centered at xy of some radius delta. And again, the game is to try to figure out, well, what radius delta should make um, a circle fit inside this blue square that I've got? So what should the radius of a circle be that fits inside this blue square? And what we're just going to do is let delta be equal to epsilon. And so because if I take the circle of radius epsilon centered at xy, then that fits inside of my blue square. And that's what I'm going to try to argue to you. I'm going to try to argue with symbols now, but then that's really the, the intuition for the rest of this proof. So let's let AB be a point that is just uh, somewhere inside of the yellow circle. And again, I'm going to try to argue to you that that point also lives inside the blue square, which justifies that the yellow circle is really in the blue square. So if AB is in the D prime ball of radius epsilon, if we take the definition of that, that says that D prime, the distance from AB to XY is less than epsilon. Now let's think about the definition of D prime. Remember, that's just the good old distance function from college algebra or the Euclidean distance from AB to XY. So X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared in a radical is less than epsilon. Next thing we're gonna do is square both sides, I believe. And if I square both sides, that just gets rid of the square root. And notice you've got epsilon squared on the right. And now I wanna think about the left side is the sum of two non-negative things. And that's those two non-negative things add up to something less than epsilon squared. That tells me that each one of those two summands, x minus a squared and y minus b squared individually must both be less than epsilon squared. Again, that's because they're both non-negative. I know that for a fact. Now when I take the square root of both sides, the, that tells me that both the absolute value of x minus a is less than epsilon and the absolute value of y minus b is less than epsilon. You know what, I see a little typo here. There should absolutely be a squared on this y minus b. So uh, please forgive me for that. There is a squared there. All right, but if I bring you back to, if you believe me, that's the absolute value of x minus a and the x absolute value of y minus b are both less than epsilon, then of course the maximum of the two is also less than epsilon. And why am I introducing that? Because I'm trying to bring d into the picture. So once I know that the maximum of those two distances are less than epsilon, that just means that the d distance from a, b to x, y is less than epsilon. So what we just showed is that the point a comma b is in the d ball centered at x, y of radius epsilon. So since a, b was an arbitrary point, this is like a typical subset proof, we just proved that the d prime ball is a subset of the d ball. And so that tells me that the d ball is open with respect to d prime. And that finishes that f inverse is a continuous function. And altogether, we've proved one through three in the definition of a homeomorphism, so we can conclude that f is a homeomorphism.